Hi, it's Miss Melissa with the Oosterhout Free Library and the last exciting chapter of Blizzard of the Blue Moon by Mary Pope Osborne, published by Scholastic. So Jack and Annie have rescued the unicorn and Merlin and Mer Merlin and Morgan have arrived to in New York to thank them. The back door of the car opened and two grown-ups stepped out. A tall, elegant woman wearing a wine-colored cloak and a man with a dark blue robe. The man had a long white beard. The woman had long white hair. Morgan! Merlin! whispered Jack. As the wizard and magical librarian of Camelot walked across the snow, Dianthus stepped forward to greet them. He bowed his head. Merlin tenderly stroked the unicorn's white neck. Morgan Le Fay turned to Jack and Annie. Hello, she said, smiling. It is good to see you both. Her lovely voice washed over Jack like music. You too, said Annie, hugging the enchantress. What are you and Merlin doing here, Jack said. I've always wanted to visit New York City, said Morgan. Teddy has just given us quite a ride in that taxi. Merlin had to tell him to slow down several times. Morgan laughed and turned towards Merlin. Quite a ride indeed, said Merlin. Greetings to you both, Jack and Annie. Greetings, they said. Thank you for saving my beloved Dianthus, said Merlin. Long ago he was stolen from Camelot by evildoers. He was rescued by magic weavers in the Netherlands. To keep him safe, they used their art to hide him in their tapestries. I knew I could entrust you two to set him free on the day the spell was to end but your mission turned out to be more dangerous than I intended. I did not know the dark wizard had sent his apprentices to follow you and capture the unicorn. Per Grinda and Ballard, said Annie, now they're ducks. Oh, do not worry, said Teddy. The spell will wear off in a few days and they'll find their way home. Yes, said Kathleen, and I'm sure the dark wizard will have some other wicked plan for them. Ay, said Merlin, but they will no longer have the use of their black rope. He picked the rope off, up from the ground and handed it to Teddy. Take this back to Camelot. See that it is destroyed. Gladly, said Teddy. It must be terrible to work for the Dark Wizard, said Annie. She looked at Merlin. I'm glad we work for you instead. Merlin smiled. And so am I, he said. On your last four missions, you and Jack have proved you know how to use magic wisely. For that, I now entrust you with one of Camelot's greatest treasures. Merlin, Merlin pulled a spiraled wand from his robe. I give you the wand of Dianthus, he said. As you see, the wand was made in the shape of a unicorn's horn. It has a bit of magic in it. Merlin held the silver wand out to Jack and Annie. Jack took the wand from Merlin. It burned in his hand with colder warmth he couldn't tell which. With the help of the wand, you can make your own magic, said Merlin. But you can only use it after you've tried your hardest, said Morgan. And remember, it can only be used for another's good. We'll remember, breathed Annie. Thank you, said Jack. He unbuckled his briefcase and carefully placed the silver wand inside. We must leave you now, said Merlin. He turned to Teddy and Kathleen. You may ride Dianthus home to Camelot. I will be along shortly, but first I'd like to drive that taxi around New York City myself. Morgan, will you join me? Indeed, said Morgan, but drive a bit more slowly than Teddy, please. I promise nothing, said Merlin. He looked at Jack and Annie. Good evening to you, my friends. I will call for you again. Bye, said Jack and Annie. Merlin took Morgan's arm and the two walked back to the taxi and climbed to the front seat. The big yellow car sputtered and then took off wildly. As it careened up the avenue, Merlin blew its horn. Auga! Auga! Chapter 10, The Wand of Dianthus. Jack, Annie, Teddy, and Kathleen laughed. My, said Kathleen, I believe I would much rather ride Dianthus than go with Merlin. The white unicorn knelt in the snow. Kathleen and T Teddy climbed onto his back. The unicorn stood up. 
Teddy smiled down at Jack and Annie. You know, tis a very great honor to be given the wand of Dianthus, he said. I know, said Jack shyly. Thanks for getting us to the right place at the right time today. Hey, were you two guys in Venice looking out for us there too, said Annie? And Baghdad? And Paris? These are other recent adventures in the Magic Treehouse series. Check them out. The two young enchanters looked at one another. Then they nodded their heads. We knew it, said Annie. Thanks for helping us. And thanks for the book of magic rhymes, said Jack. You are most welcome, said Teddy. And now we must go. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye, said Annie. She stroked the unicorn's neck one last time. Dianthus lowered his head and stared at her with his soft blue eyes. They sparkled in the last bit of daylight. Annie stood on her toes and whispered in the unicorn's ear. Then she stepped back. Dianthus snorted. He raised his head. Then he leapt forward. In a flash of silver, the unicorn and his two riders were gone. Standing in the cold dusk, Annie stared silently into the distance. What did you say to him? asked Jack. I told him he had to go with Teddy and Kathleen, Annie said. She blinked back tears. I told him they would show him the way now. Oh, said Jack. He put his hand on Annie's back. Don't worry. We'll see Dianthus again someday. I just feel it. Annie smiled. You're starting to sound like me, she said. Uh-oh, said Jack. He shivered. Night was falling fast. Ready? Sure, let's go, said Annie. She followed Jack to the treehouse and up the rope ladder. They climbed inside and looked out the window. The lights of New York City were starting to come on. A full moon was rising over the snow-covered park. Hello, blue moon, said Jack. Goodbye, blue moon, said Annie. Jack picked up the scroll from Merlin. He pointed to the words Frog Creek in Merlin's note. I wish we could go home, he said. The wind started to blow. The tree house started to spin. It spun faster and faster, and then everything was still, absolutely still. I love that part. A cold wind blew through the Frog Creek woods. A few fat snowflakes drifted into the tree house. Jack and Annie were dressed in their own clothes again. Jack's briefcase had turned back into a backpack. Jack quickly opened the pack and looked inside. Good, he said. The wand of Dianthus is still here. Should we take it home with us, asked Annie. I think so, said Jack. We can keep it safe until our next mission. He pulled Teddy and Kathleen's book of rhymes out of his pack. I guess we can keep our book of rhymes as a souvenir, he said. We won't be using it anymore since we used up all the rhymes. He stuffed the book into his backpack. We still haven't used all of them, said Annie. We still have one left, remember? Find a treasure you must never lose. Oh, I already used that one, said Jack. Come on, let's go. He grabbed his pack and started down the rope ladder. What do you mean you already used that one? Annie said as she followed him down. When did, you, then when did we use that rhyme? Jack stepped to the ground. How do you think I found you when you got lost in Central Park, he asked. Wait, you thought I was a treasure, said Annie. Jack shrugged. I guess, he said. At least I did today. Annie smiled. Cool, she said. Thanks for finding me when you were lost. Not me, you, said Jack. You're the one who's lost. No, you, said Annie. You, said Jack. You, 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 said Annie. Jack laughed. Whatever, he said. Let's go have some of Dad's hot chocolate. The snow began to fall harder. As the cold wind rattled the bare trees of the Frog Creek Woods, Jack and Annie hurried home. Now the authors put in more facts for Jack and Annie and you. And I have some too. I found pictures of the tapestry room at the cloisters that were taken in the year this story has set. So I'm attaching pictures of that and also the website address for the Cloisters Museum. It's an amazing place. I've been there. You really should check out all the art on their website. The Great Depression. Today, older New Yorkers remember the Great Depression as one of the most difficult times in the city's history. Lasting from 1929 till about 1939, the Depression was a time when all of America, as well as much of the world, 
suffered terrible economic problems and caused many people to lose their jobs. Subways. Today, millions of people ride the New York subways every day. There are over 400 miles of tracks. Riders no longer drop coins or tokens into a slot in the turnstiles, though. They now slide a metro card through an electronic card reader. Central Park. Today, more than 250,000 people might visit Central Park on a warm weekend and picnic, jog, skate, bicycle, listen to music, or walk dogs. Designed over 150 years ago, Central Park was the first major park created entirely for public use. Its designer, Frederick Law Olmsted, believed that nature could lift the spirits of city dwellers and bring together people from all walks of life. Belvedere Castle. Today, Belvedere Castle is a cent in Central Park serves as a nature observatory. If you live in New York City, you have often heard on TV or the radio, the temperature in Central Park is. That information comes from the weather instruments that are still housed in the castle. John D. Rockefeller. Today, Americans remember John D. Rockefeller as being one of the richest men in the country. After founding the Standard Oil Company, he focused on giving away half his fortune. Through Rockefeller's generosity, a small museum in Fort Hiram Park in the northern part of the city was acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. That museum became known as the Cloisters. Today, the Cloisters is filled with approximately 5,000 works of medieval art, including many works from Rockefeller's own medieval art collection, such as the famous unicorn tapestry. Unicorns. Well, she has an entry in unicorns, but I think I'll skip that one because we have lots of unicorn things planned for this summer in our virtual summer reading program. We'll talk more about that soon.